Chapter 3. Living or Working with a Disorganized Person Clashes over clutter are a source of enormous stress in relationships. Whether the culprit is your spouse, child, teen, roommate, parent, co-worker, or boss, the only thing more frustrating than not being able to clear your own clutter is living or working with a disorganized person. The refusal of someone you love or work with to clean up, clear out, or cooperate as you try to improve the state of your home or office is absolutely maddening. It feels awful to come home at the end of a stressful day to someone else's mess. It's upsetting to have your own productivity at work impinged upon by a chaotic boss or co-worker who may keep misplacing key information and then asking you to stop what you're doing to help him or her find it. Perhaps you don't live with a clutter culprit, but you are concerned about someone you care about. You may worry about a friend whose social life is restricted because of the mess in his or her home, or the safety of an elderly relative. Your aging parents or aunt's home may be in such a state of disarray, you know that if they don't deal with it, it'll be your mess to clean when they are gone. Do any of these voices sound familiar? I've never been perfect, but my husband is an even worse slob. I'm finally ready to get organized, but I can't make any progress unless he's willing to go along with me. I've spent entire days setting up new systems, but he completely ignores them and then just makes a bigger mess. I don't know why I even try, but I can't stand living this way anymore. I hate our house. A 34-year-old wife. We live in a two-story house. Minutes after I finish straightening up and go downstairs, the kids have undone everything. I am so frustrated by the state of my home. Even after spending hours cleaning it, it's still a wreck. Mom with two children. My problem is not my house, but my mother's. Growing up, it was so full of clutter and junk that it was embarrassing to have friends come over. I can't fully explain how overwhelming it is to visit her. My brother and I both have small children, and they stumble all over her junk. Her kitchen is full of papers, and there are boxes of food everywhere. I'm sure there are misplaced bank accounts and insurance policies lost in the mess. It's hard to bring this up with her because she gets upset and frustrated. Forty-year-old daughter. The worst of it is what appears to be the other person's utter lack of consideration. No matter how many times you tell them the mess upsets you, they don't do anything to change. Don't they have any respect for your needs? Don't they care about you? What can you do about it? How can you motivate others to change their burdensome ways? How do you navigate a relationship with someone who has a different threshold for chaos than you do? Before you go tearing your hair out, or theirs, keep the following two realities in mind. Number one, you can't motivate someone else to get organized. I hate to break it to you, but just as with losing weight or quitting smoking, you will never succeed in motivating someone else to get organized. People only change when there is some internal personal goal driving them. Organizing is too tough a journey to take just to please someone else, no matter how much they care about you. Nagging doesn't help. In fact, the more you yell, lecture, threaten, tempt, cajole, and beg, the more closed off, defensive, and resistant to change the person is likely to become. It seems counterintuitive, but by taking yourself and your own frustrations out of the picture, you are in a much stronger position to facilitate change. The secret to breakthrough is to tap into the person's own motivation, which you can easily do by asking one simple question. What is the clutter costing them? Perhaps your spouse worries about the image projected to clients by constantly showing up harried and disheveled after yet another morning searching for a missing tie or suit. Your teenagers may be frustrated at losing points for lateness, for example getting B's on A quality work, downgraded because it is submitted two days late. Young children may be embarrassed that they were the only ones to miss a class trip because they forgot their permission slips.
Your boss may be weary of the turnover rate in his or her staff and inability to handle more business. By finding the real costs of the clutter, you are effectively turning the tables. This isn't about you. It's about something that could benefit them. So what if they don't feel the clutter is costing them anything? What if they are completely happy with their systems, or lack thereof? During a break in a seminar I was giving, an empathetic but desperate earth mother of a woman came up to me, begging for advice on how to motivate her recently retired husband to pick up after himself. Apparently, he was never very organized, but while he was working, she was in charge of the house, and he never had time to make much of a mess. Now that he was retired and home all day, the house was an utter wreck. He left piles of stuff all over the place, and she was going absolutely crazy. There was constant tension between them. He was always wanting to go places with her, to the movies, shopping, hiking, visiting friends, and she couldn't relax until the house was fairly neat. It was obvious to me that they had a common goal. They both wanted to enjoy his retirement. I suggested she point out to him that each pile he left about represented a minimum half-hour delay in their getting out the door. Putting things away would bring him closer to his own goal, to get out and have fun. Once you can identify what being disorganized really costs, spin it as a positive. Getting organized will help your teens raise their grades, your spouse to close more deals, your children to go on more class trips, and your boss to save money on staff turnover. Just remember, their motivation has to be for themselves. It's not about you. Number two, their mess is not an expression of disrespect. Being angry and blaming the other person for being inconsiderate is a major stumbling block to peaceful resolutions. Adopting a more insightful and compassionate point of view of the other person will free you to work on realistic and creative solutions. As inconsiderate as their behavior may feel, the truth is other people's clutter usually has nothing to do with us. The clutter is their own issue, driven by their own needs, vantage points, and perceptions. It helps to consider what their points of view might be. Possibility number one. They actually don't see the mess, either because they are not as visual as you, or because they are simply focused on other things. Creative people are very inwardly focused and forever preoccupied with new projects and ideas. Alternatively, they may be so distracted by personal problems that they pay no attention to their physical environment, or they're so busy and overwhelmed with their workload that they're just thinking about the next place they have to be. Either way, the mess is invisible to them. That's why when you're screaming at them to clean it up, they often look at you in wonderment, head cocked to one side, as if to ask, What mess? Possibility number two. Their chaos serves a psychological function. As you'll remember from chapter two, there are at least ten common reasons people find comfort in clutter— no matter how much they crave organization. Re-listen to chapter 2, paying particular attention to the following psychological obstacles. Need for abundance, fear of losing creativity, sentimental attachment, need to retreat, and conquistador of chaos. Understanding the function the clutter serves for them will help you release your anger and blame. They really aren't doing this to hurt you, they are held back by some internal need or pain. Possibility number three. Perhaps this person is not disorganized, but differently organized. In other words, there is a method behind the madness that works for him or her, though its logic may escape you. How can you tell if others simply have a different organizing style than you? Two simple questions will lead you to the answer. Can they always find what they need when they need it? Are they comfortable in their space? If the answer to either is yes, you are not dealing with someone who is disorganized. They are simply 
differently organized. Three solutions. Regardless of whether people don't notice the mess, thrive on chaos, or have a system you don't understand, the bottom line is that their chaotic ways drive you crazy. So, what do you do about it? You have three options to choose from. You can 1. Let it go. Love them despite their messiness and just pick up after them. 2. Co-design shared spaces. Learn to live together by acknowledging you have different styles and co-design your common spaces. 3. Help the person get organized. Assist him or her in designing a system that will work for him or her, assuming it's the person's own space that needs organized, not a shared space, and he or she has asked for your help. Insider's Tip Helping someone with ADD or OCD. If the person you are living or working with has been diagnosed with Attention Deficit Disorder, ADD, or Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, OCD, their organizational problems may have a biological basis. This doesn't mean that they can't get organized. In fact, the techniques in organizing from the inside out have been found to be very effective for those suffering from ADD and OCD because the approach is so customizable and the systems are so visual, fun, and engaging. In working with ADD and OCD clients over the years, I've found that they have a tremendous capacity for organization as long as they are supported in their efforts. I've found three commonalities. 1. They often come up with superb organizing systems but fall short because the system is missing one or two key connectors. For example, they come up with an excellent way of organizing most of their files, but get stuck on one category which they end up calling miscellaneous. They see this as an irreparable hole in their system, so they start from scratch again. You can get them off this track by helping them find the missing link that will tie their system together into a workable whole. I wish the whole were always in the same spot, but alas, it seldom is. So it'll be your job to find the missing link in their system. 2. People with ADD and OCD tend to be extremely bright. They can grasp big-picture concepts as well as the tiny details. The problem is that sometimes they see too many details and nuances and get wrapped up in them. Your job in that case is to help them rise above the details and create a system that is good enough. Then demonstrate how effective the system is and give them permission to move on to other projects. 3. I've observed that ADD and OCD clients who are on proper medication do have an easier time getting and staying organized. This is not to advocate medication, but to share the fact that I've seen a difference in the capacity to maintain systems between clients on appropriate medication and those who aren't. Other sources you may find useful. Books, Driven to Distraction, and Answers to Distraction – by Ned Hallowell and John Rady. For more information on ADD slash OCD and organizing, please read ADD Friendly Ways to Organize Your Life by Judith Kohlberg and Kathleen Nadeau. Websites www.add.org, www.chadd.org, and www.nsgcd.org. National Study Group on Chronic Disorganization. Solution number one, let it go. In some situations, you may decide that in the grand scheme of things, battling over messy piles of stuff is not worth the damage it is doing to your relationship. When might you make this choice? If your spouse is suffering from ADD or OCD, supporting him or her in other ways may be a way to feel closer. If your boss is a chaotic mess but generates huge amounts of money for the company, maybe you just accept that this is his or her creative style and your contribution to the team is to quietly and respectfully straighten up so that the next time he or she is ready to close a deal and needs a phone number, it's exactly where it should be. Perhaps you and your significant other may not get to spend very much quality time together and fighting about the mess is just not the way you want to spend it. 
Your kids may be making a mess now, but when they are grown and gone, you will regret that you spent half their childhoods yelling at them about their clutter. What's fascinating to me is that we are always bothered more by someone else's mess than our own. Our piles don't look so bad, because we know what's in them. Oh, that stack? Those are receipts for assembling my tax return. That pile? Those are clothes I'm sending to the shelter. But everyone else's piles look like junk, because we have no understanding of their contents. With further thought, you may realize that your reaction is over the top, and has less to do with the other person than with your own psychological baggage. One woman told me it took her years of nagging her husband about his mess before she realized it didn't really bother her. But she did fear her super neat mother coming in and criticizing the way she ran her house. Many disorganized parents get upset at the clutter in their kids' rooms because they see it as a painful reflection of their own shortcomings a skill they have been unable to teach their kids. So sometimes, the best way to deal with the problem is to simply change your own attitude or perspective, to decide to love that person despite the messiness and build your relationship in a more positive way. Sometimes, a change in your attitude has the surprising effect of bringing other people around. If, instead of feeling defensive, they feel supported, they may even consider a change. One visitor to my website wrote about an experience she had along those lines. My husband always had the irritating habit of leaving cabinet doors and drawers open and clothes all over the floor. He'd make a sandwich and leave the mayonnaise and dirty dish on the counter. For years I'd get upset and fuss at him about this. Then one day, I quit fussing at my husband about those particular issues. They just weren't important enough in the overall scheme of things to be worth making him feel bad about himself. I changed my attitude by changing what I said to myself when I came across open doors and rumpled towels. I taught myself to shrug, chuckle, and say, oh well, at least I know he's home. He had to travel a lot when we were first married. And you know what? Over time, he improved. He saw me going around behind him, closing doors and drawers and picking up the laundry, and he began doing those things himself, without my nagging or yelling at him. Now, he almost never forgets, and when he does forget, so what? It's not a big deal anymore. I'm not suggesting that if you adopt the let-it-go approach, the other person will magically come around and the clutter will go away. Letting go is simply about picking your battles and deciding which issues are worth fighting about and which aren't. If you choose to just let it go, here are some ways to keep your sanity. Look to where the piles are and create storage there. Place containers to catch the piles in the very spots where your family tends to drop things. You are not moving things from where they were dropped, so family members can't angrily accuse you of moving and losing their things. You are simply hiding the clutter exactly where they put it. And if they can't go so far as to lift the lid and put the stuff away on their own, go ahead and do it yourself. If it's easy for you to hide it without moving it, why not? Purchase a lightweight tote basket or box for each family member. Set a rule that any stray items found in the common spaces, living room, kitchen, or dining room, will be gathered into their container and delivered to the person's room. Alternatively, set up one room or closet in your house as the lost and found zone and bring all stray items there. Put up a screen or throw a sheet over it. Sometimes, managing other people's clutter is all about clever room placement. One client gave her messy husband the far side of bedroom, farthest from the door, so that the magazines and papers he piled on the floor next to the bed were completely out of her sight line. Another family floated their sofa in the center of their living room, leaving plenty of space behind it as the kids' play area. Upon entering the room, they couldn't see the mess behind the sofa. Legend has it, that Anne Chase shared an office with her father, the mogul who publishes Chase's calendar of annual events. His desk was always a mess. Rather than complain, or ask him to clean up for her, she just threw a sheet over the top, 
worked for the afternoon, and then removed the sheet when she left. Talk about cohabitating. Solution number two. Co-design shared spaces. How do you negotiate living space with someone whose organizing style and threshold for chaos are very different than yours? If you are sharing space, the answer is to work together towards solutions that acknowledge your individual styles. Before we continue here, we'll read the Insider's Tip on page 41. Insider's Tip, Living with a Pack Rat Living with a Pack Rat a person who holds on to huge quantities of paper, reading material, and belongings that go back years, even decades, can be the most frustrating situation of all. Pack ratting can pose a safety or fire hazard. It can inhibit your social life because there's literally no space for visitors. It can lead to the loss of valuable financial statements such as stock fund purchases, insurance policies, or important medical records. Recognize that hoarding is a serious issue with deep psychological roots. If you feel there is a safety or financial hazard, my recommendation is to approach the person with compassion and understanding. Respectfully acknowledge that the stuff is important to that person, or that having a lot of stuff is important. See Chapter 2, What's Holding You Back? However, Point out that the volume of items is causing a health, safety, or financial hazard, and in fact is probably making it hard for him or her to find what's most important. You can then ask that person to identify what he or she thinks are the most valuable items in the space. In other words, what that person would be most worried about losing if it all disappeared. And then offer to help that person locate and preserve those items. I call this searching for treasures, not the trash. The excess items can be sent to storage as a temporary stopgap measure to keep the person from being too traumatized by the sudden disappearance of it all. In essence, you are giving the person a chance to test drive clutter-free living. Finally, consider encouraging the person to go over for counseling. Extreme hoarding can have its roots in OCD, ADD, or some other life trauma. Back to co-designing shared spaces. Here are some suggestions. Establish different rules for common areas and private areas. Give each person one private space of his or her own, to be kept any way he or she likes. Then, organize your common rooms together. Bathroom, living room, kitchen, using the process taught in part two of this book. Divvy up room responsibilities. Make the person who uses the space the most the one responsible for organizing it. For example, whoever does the cooking organizes the kitchen. Whoever pays the bills organizes the home files. The organizer then labels the system and creates an index so the other person can follow it. Avoiding common pitfalls. I am not a fan of the idea of just throwing out another person's belongings or threatening to do so if they don't shape up. This breaks the bond of trust between you and can be genuinely traumatic for the person. What looks like junk to you may be emotionally priceless to the other person. Some people feel free to periodically toss some of their kid's artwork or junky party favors when their kid isn't looking, a spouse's old mail and catalogs, a parent's old coupons. This is ultimately a personal choice that you must make based on your own sense of integrity and your genuine knowledge of the person's relationship to his or her belongings. My experience is that talking with the person and reaching a genuine and honest agreement on what stays and what goes is a far better approach. Organizing together is a rare opportunity to learn how the other person thinks, to share goals and dreams, to discover what's truly important to the other person. You may be surprised by what you find out. When you co-design your common spaces, proceed with caution, so that the experience is fun rather than fraught with conflict. Remember, you are looking for compromises, 
and we'll probably have to approach the entire interaction with a more open mind. This is an opportunity to get closer to your partner, if you approach it with care. George and Nancy were a colorful couple who called me in because their two-bedroom apartment was wheezing under the weight of their combined creative vocations. Nancy worked from home as a writer and film critic. The second bedroom served as her office. George was a musician, artist, and antiques dealer who could always see the potential in the old, the broken, the forgotten. For years, they had been bickering about how to get their home under control. Each accused the other of being responsible for the disorder. George said he likes having systems, but she destroys them. Nancy claimed George starts systems and never finishes them. She continued, I'm the one who does all the organizing. I know where everything goes. When George puts something down for a minute, it never leaves that spot. No, you move it on me, interrupted George, and then I can't find it, and you never remember where you put it. Watching them argue, it was clear that they weren't listening to each other. They spent most of the time giving advice on what the other person should do. Nancy, you've got to get rid of some of those videos. You never watch half of them. George, you can't turn our house into a repair shop. There's not enough space. If you aren't going to fix the keyboard, you should get rid of it. They needed to agree on a few rules to ensure a more successful organizing journey together. Here were my recommendations. Schedule a mutually acceptable time. Put the phone on voicemail to avoid distraction or interruptions. You'll need to focus all your attention on each other and your stuff. Concentrate on your shared goal. Work toward a home you both enjoy and the ability to find your stuff. Be willing to compromise. Take joint ownership of the problems and solutions you encounter. Never start any sentence with, you should. Instead, speak in the we. As in, how do we want to solve this problem? Assume the other person has a valid reason for the way he or she does things. Listen carefully until you understand. Repeat back to confirm your understanding. Stay focused. Avoid jumping from one project to another. If you start in the living room, stay there. Finally, have fun. Get a little bell and ring it the minute anyone breaks one of the rules. I suggested that George and Nancy have a practice run, working together on one small area to see how applying the rules feels. They selected the sideboard, a bone of much contention. They chose to tackle it on Sunday afternoon, estimating it would take them two to three hours. I told them I'd be back in three days to hear them present the system they'd designed together. I showed up on Tuesday to an impeccable sideboard and a beaming, affectionate couple. Together, they toured me through the system they'd created. The project had only taken them a single hour. They were overlapping more than interrupting each other as they laughed and explained their discoveries and solutions. They'd had fun, finding humor in their humanity rather than screaming about it. Look, we had 576 writing utensils bulging out of three pencil cups. Do we really write this much? Ultimately, they decided, as writers, well, yes, there's always a pen in hand. For ease of use, they separated the implements into three categories. Pens, markers, mechanical pencils. When you move in with someone, you may think how many pens to keep is too small a thing to negotiate. But as Nancy and George learned, you might as well discuss it pleasantly now, because if you don't, you'll end up fighting about it later. Solution number three. Help a buddy organize his or her own space. This is the most intimate and helpful support you can offer. Two things keep people from letting others help them get organized. A fear of judgment and a fear that they'll be forced to throw things away. If someone you know, a child, spouse, friend, parent, or coworker, has invited you to help him or her get organized, consider it an honor and proceed with care. Letting you into his or her mess takes courage and trust. 
Helping someone get organized offers a means by which the two of you can build a relationship or strengthen an already existing one. Let's face it, tackling those piles can be a lonely, tedious journey. If you are able to offer positive, nurturing companionship along the way, your boss, spouse, child, parent, or friend may be grateful forever. Before you go in to help, tune into how they may be feeling by putting yourself in their place. Organizing requires setting priorities and making tough decisions, which can be anxiety-provoking. Think back to a time when you were in a state of transition and turmoil, feeling vulnerable, exposed, unsure of yourself, overwhelmed, and afraid of being judged. Now, picture the person you found most helpful to you. How did that person behave? Did he or she make an effort to really understand what you were going through? Keep you company in that space? Listen patiently while you talked through the pros and cons? Rush you into making decisions? Tell you what to do? Going into someone else's mess with them requires patience, understanding, and a sense of adventure. Avoiding common mistakes. Don't impose your will on another person just because you'd like to organize his or her space. Do a reality check. Whose idea is it for you to help? Does the person want help? Has the person mentioned that he or she would like to get organized? Or is it just your idea? If you are forcing the situation, I guarantee you're headed for an ugly crash. Along the same lines, I don't recommend that you organize for anyone without him or her being present. In other words, don't make the mistake of organizing someone's closets, kitchen, or desk without having the person there to participate in the design decisions. If you do, the space may be beautiful to look at, but impossible for the person to maintain. You aren't there to make the space work for you. You've got to make it work for that person. The idea is to organize with that friend or loved one. Learn how his or her mind works. Design the system around the way that person thinks, not the way you do, so that it is natural and logical for him or her to maintain. Being a good clutter buddy. Use the following strategies to ensure that your organizing projects bring you and the person closer instead of into conflict. Do just one small space first to see how it goes. Build the person's confidence by pointing out ways he or she already is organized. Everyone is organized someplace, somewhere, in some way. One of your most important jobs as coach and guide is to help your buddy change his or her self-image as hopelessly disorganized. Instead, concentrate on the positive. Maybe your kid's room is a mess, but he or she always returns in homework on time. Maybe your boss has papers piled everywhere, but he or she can always find the most critical information when it's time to close a deal. Recognize the ways in which your boss is organized, and let him or her know you are confident in his or her ability to apply those skills to other areas of life as well. Have fun, but don't make fun. It's okay to set an upbeat atmosphere, but never say things as, You're so disorganized. You're such a slob. This place is a pigsty. Avoid assumptions. The quickest way to insult your buddy is to hold something up and say, Ooh, this is hideous. You want to throw this out, don't you? Whoops, it's their favorite sweater. Remove the pressure to get rid of stuff. Forget the myth that getting organized means throwing stuff out. This approach creates temporary results and lots of anxiety and resistance. The truth is, organizing isn't about getting rid of things at all. It's about identifying what's important to you and giving those things a reliable, consistent home. Assure your buddy he or she can keep everything he or she uses and loves. Respect the privacy of the other person. Don't open any drawers or cabinets without asking permission first. When sorting papers, try not to read any more than is necessary. For example, if you come across a visa bill, 
don't peek to see how much was spent. If you come across something that you think your buddy might find embarrassing, bury it back in a pile and let your buddy find it before you so your buddy can save face. And whatever you do, don't gossip to other friends or family members about what you found or how messy the place is. That would be disrespectful and embarrassing. Work in two to four hour sessions. Less than that, you can't make much progress. More than that may be too much for either of you. Organizing requires a lot of decision making. It's hard to go for too long. When your buddy's eyes glaze over, it's time to stop. Finding a good resting point and restore order so your buddy can function until the next organizing session. Make the project physically easy on your buddy. Gather containers, tie up filled trash bags, help with labeling, transport giveaways, and return objects that belong in other rooms to their original homes. Pre-sort large piles into more manageable stacks for your buddy to review and make decisions about. Respect your buddy's way of thinking, goals, and attachments. Maybe you'd group shirts by short and long sleeve, but your friend prefers to group by color or style. You might be a filer, while your spouse is a piler. As long as the system works for him or her, support it. The beauty of organizing is that different things work for different people. Share your ideas, but let people find what works for them. Keep the person focused and energized. Set a high-energy, upbeat, productive pace. Remember that this isn't easy. Stick to the task at hand, doing one room at a time, one section at a time. If your buddy gets overwhelmed or discouraged, Remind your buddy of the payoff, the reasons for wanting to get organized. Be a good cheerleader. Be a good sounding board. Help your buddy think through decisions about how to design systems, whether to keep items, or where to store them. Ask neutral questions. Do you use it? Do you love it? Where would you go to look for this? What has worked for you in the past? Then, pitch in with your ideas. Keep the ideas flowing. Brainstorming works. Most important, be in the moment for your friend or loved one. Upbeat, patient, and confident in his ability or her ability to succeed. Have fun. Becoming organized is a process, mastered and refined over a lifetime. Remember that organizing is a skill, not a talent, that can be learned. It's always easier to organize someone other than yourself. By helping your buddy, you're likely to uncover both your latent organizing skills the next time he or she can coach you through your piles. Whether you are organizing yourself or helping someone else, there is a right and a wrong way to approach the project. Part 2 will teach you the true secrets of a professional organizer, how to create a system that works and lasts.